All right, so now I want to talk very quickly about the gut microbiome, which is related to your diet and mental health. So um, I teach this, this is, I'm going to put this into three or four slides. This is a 14-hour course I teach on the microbiome. We're going to condense into very short information here. So just to give you some foundational knowledge, and I know Dr. Goldhammer talked about this too, there are 100,000 more, times more microbes in one human gut than people on the earth. This is a very big colony, all right? 100 trillion cells total. It means that only 10% of our cells are human and the rest are renters renting space from us in the gut. These, these bacteria perform certain functions from us. There are 1,000 species containing 7 million genes, 360 genes for every one human gene. So I want to impress upon you the importance, the size of this population. Humans and microbes depend on each other for survival. We get more from the microbes than they get from us. The gut microbiome right now is part of every medical specialty. I don't think I discuss any diseases where it's not at least brought up for discussion, including, and I don't like to even call it a disease, but psychological disorders. So how do you get your microbiome? Well, we get some of it in the placenta. There are about 300 different species there. Um, vaginal birth, babies born vaginally acquire bacteria in the birth canal, and then breastfeeding. And so already you can see we have some problems. People, increasing number of people born by a cesarean birth. We have the highest birth rate in the United States of cesarean birth in the world. And while sometimes that's necessary, it's overused. And then a lot of formula feeding rather than breastfeeding. And then diet, which I'll get to in a minute. So microbes talk to each other, and the microbes talk to the brain. Um, the gut microbes influence our emotions, our pain sensitivity, our social interactions, decision making. They generate and send signals to the brain and they can reinforce and prolong our emotional state. The connection is hardwired, by the way, through the vagus nerve and then it also involves molecules traveling through the bloodstream. And the gut has its own nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system, ENS or second brain, which is made up of between 50 and 100 million uh, nerve cells. All right, so feelings of anger and threat and fear override and divert the ENS from its routine. Stress hormones like cortisol are released. Nerve signals are sent to the EMS, ENS that inhibit function. The behavior of the microbes is altered. It's influenced by bad things like traffic and stress, and it's influenced by good things like hugs and sharing a meal with friends. Dysbiosis and inflammation in the gut are linked to psychological issues, including anxiety and depression. And functions are affected, like your digestion can stop, stomach doesn't empty properly, you have diarrhea, or you vomit. There are a number, there, the number of endocrine cells in the gut are more than the total of all endocrine cells throughout the rest of the body. And if you spread them all out, it's bigger than a basketball court. The signals are sent to the brain, things that you're familiar with, fullness, nausea, discomfort. Um, and then we also get signals from the brain. We call them gut responses. And I want you to consider this for a minute, how much language we have that talks about the gut and emotions. Has anybody ever said this? I have a gut feeling about this. Anybody said that was a gut-wrenching experience, right? How about I'm all choked up? Butterflies in my stomach, all right? So the reason why our language is filled with those kinds of statements is there's such a relationship between the gut and some of the feelings that we have. So the gut is the largest storage depot for serotonin. It's used to regulate normal gut function, sleep, appetite, pain, sensitivity, mood. So people always think about serotonin because you've heard so much about it as serotonin in the brain and mood, but serotonin is a hormone that does a whole lot of other things for your body. Um, and it's produced by the enterochromaffin cells in the gut. So it functions as a hormone and then also functions as a neurotransmitter as well. Um, SSRIs, drugs like Prozac, are used to treat depression, and some of the side effects of those drugs include nausea and diarrhea. So it's interesting that drugs that are targeted to treat depression have such an effect on the gut. Um, serotonin release affects emotions and feelings, and here's something that's interesting. Food moving through the system stimulates those enterochromaffin cells to produce serotonin. So first of all, that's why people can feel better after eating. That's one reason. It's another reason why people feel better after adopting a plant-based diet. Because first of all, it's a moving experience. Have you all had that? All right. But the second thing is that fiber moves food through the system more quickly, which means that you have to eat more frequently. Um, you know, when people eat like really high fat, high protein lunch, they can go for six hours without eating again. If you eat something really high fiber, high carbohydrate, you eat lunch at noon and by about 3.30, you're probably ready for something to eat again. So there's a, going back to what I said earlier, where 
Um, I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm just talking about people who, who will say often in changing their diet, something I didn't expect is how much happier I feel. I really feel better on this diet. So there's a biological reason for that. So the gut microbiome and psychological issues, I think it's interesting that in 1933 they were writing about this. So a psychiatrist by the name of Joseph Kilman wrote, it is far from our mind to conceive that all mental conditions have the same ideological factor, but we feel justified in recognizing the existence of cases of mental disorders which have a basis, a basic ideological factor, a toxic condition arising in the gastrointestinal tract. So we knew that in 1933, we probably knew it before then, we just don't talk about this stuff because it's a lot more profitable to sell drugs to people. It's a lot more profitable to be a psychiatrist who prescribes drugs to people because then you don't have to take time to talk to them, right? So um, lots of things happen. You'll hear more about that from Dr. Bregan. So negative changes to the microbiome are common in conditions associated with a higher incidence of depression, like IBS, chronic fatigue, obesity, and um, type, 1, type 2 diabetes. So here are just a few studies, some on animals, some on people. Germ-free animals bred for research have significant alterations in brain development, especially the parts of the brain involving emotional regulation. Transplanting fecal pellets from an extrovert mouse turns an introvert mouse into an extrovert. All right? um, microbes from obese mites can turn lean mice into overeaters. Interaction between the brain and the gut can either promote optimal health or destroy health or make people vulnerable to many diseases and reinforce negative emotions. Intestinal permeability is a common finding among kids, uh, family members who have autistic family members. All right? So we see this very close connection between the gut and the brain and emotions and emotional regulation. Doesn't mean that you're, you have a chemical imbalance in the brain. Doesn't mean that you don't need therapy. It means that if you eat better and get good therapy, you're probably going to get better faster. Now I think this is really interesting. We prescribe a lot of antibiotics. It's, the antibiotics are tremendously overprescribed, and we have a lot of problems resulting from this, including antibiotic resistant bacterial infections like MRSA and C. diff, which used to only happen in the hospital, and now we see them in community settings. Well, the development of all kinds of problems follow an antibiotic regimen. One of those problems is destruction of the gut microbiome. We're increasingly using broad spectrum antibiotics, and the problem is that they're indiscriminate bacterial killers. So anyway, it's interesting, an analysis of patient records showed that people with serious mental disorders who were hospitalized for mania were more likely to be taking antibiotics for infection than people hospitalized without psychological problems. Um, many studies have shown that taking antibiotics can lead to psychiatric and behavioral problems, and in addition to the, um, uh, the destruction of what's called the commensal bacteria, the gut microbiome living in your gut, the bacteria living in your gut, it may be due to damage to the mitochondria as well. So, um, review of studies looking at the connection between vegan diets, gut bacteria, and inflammation. The vegan diets had the best effect. And so if you've screwed up your gut microbiome, and that, and that is part of your problem, and it can be part of your problem if you have diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune disease, allergies, asthma, and depression and anxiety, um, changing your diet is, it can, can really have a profound effect. And I just picked one study and I'll, I'll read you the conclusion because I think it's important. I could show you 200 like this. The vegan gut profile appears to be unique in several characteristics, including a reduced abundance of pathobionts and a greater abundance of protective species. Vegans also appear to lack the intestinal microbiota for uh, converting dietary L-carnitine into the proatherosclerotic TMAO. Reduced levels of inflammation may be the key feature in linking the vegan gut microbiota to protective health benefits. And so it doesn't get much more clear than that. that the, 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 the vegan diet is best for your gut microbiome, and a healthy gut microbiome is good for your psychological state. Probiotics. In mouse experiments, probiotics were shown to lower anxiety levels, uh, particularly lactobacillus, which is one of the primary bacteria that you want to start taking when you're restoring your gut. Um, when stress tests were administered, the mice given the bacteria we're willing to venture out into open spaces. More than control is more likely to struggle instead of give up one's forced to swim. Um, in fact, the effect of probiotics was similar to the effect of antidepressant drugs when they were given to mice. I think it's a whole lot safer to take probiotics than antidepressant drugs. Uh, John Cryan, who's an Irish psychiatrist, did some rat studies using bifidobacterium, gave it to rats, reduced their depression and anxiety as much as Lexapro. And you can see here the list of references. Other studies have confirmed that the probiotics are as effective as Lexapro. Um, 
IBS patients, twice as many patients taking a probiotic reported improvements in depressive symptoms as controls taking a placebo. A double-blind placebo-controlled study showed that 30-day supplementation with lactobacillus and bifidobacteria lowered psychological distress and depression and decreased hanger and hostility. So some good reasons to take probiotics. And again, we could, we could go on and on. I could show you slide after slide after slide after slide, and it starts to become repetitious. The take-home point is that taking probiotics is good for your gut. A review of 10 studies included, concluded that daily probiotic supplementation can improve mood, anxiety, and cognitive symptoms in people with major depression. The most significant effect was on anxiety. And researchers con concluded that this might be a good idea uh, because of the limitations on drugs, including limited efficacy and safety issues. And you'll hear more about that later. There are some significant safety issues. So again, not reading more studies to you, but same thing. Randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of patients with CFS, chronic fatigue, um, reduced their depression. Five studies taking probiotics resulted in, in significant reduction in depression and reduction in risk of depression. So where are we right now? Adopt an optimal plant-based diet. Take a daily probiotic. Does that sound easier than taking Lexapro and Prozac and Xana? How many people think that's a better idea? OK. Again, not a substitute for therapy to resolve the thinking disorders and the problems that you have to resolve in everyday life. That's why good therapists are really worth seeking out. But if you're going to therapy and you're shaping up your body, you're probably going to get more out of the therapy. The you know, really, when you think about it, it's kind of another level. Um, you know, when I was talking about individual nutrients and in foods, dietary pattern. OK, so how about dietary pattern, probiotics, therapy, and now we'll talk about exercise. Do all of it. Most people who get better do a lot of things to make their health better, a lot of things. You don't really see many case reports in the medical literature saying a person who is depressed, overweight, diabetic, had a banged up knee and migraine headaches, took omega-3 fatty acids, and it all went away. Okay, I've never read a report like that. You've never met anybody like that. People do multiple things to improve their health, and that's what I'm suggesting here.